This is a talk about implementation, about doing small specific jobs that we've identified which are small enough for us to do but which have some leverage in terms of potential impact. This kind of thing is a minority sport within IGC. It's the kind of thing that is occasional and opportunistic. You work in a network like this, then sometimes you stumble on things that are worth fixing. And they're small enough jobs that they're doable and they seem to be worth doing. Now we're not going to give you any systematic evidence. We're just sharing experience from two cases. We want to emphasize that we don't see ourselves as the people who are doing these jobs. We want to emphasize very heavily that we believe these jobs are being done by the director of the agency involved or the head of the unit involved. Uh, we're there to offer a plan and help to see it through implementation. That's our job. Now, in both cases, and this is the commonality that I discovered in talking to Rocco about his work and the motivation for having this session, in both cases we've discovered that what we're actually doing is we're struggling to embed new and different practices and procedures into an existing organization. And what we want to do is just share some personal experience we've had of doing that kind of job. And that's all that this session is going to be about. Now, in identifying a target for action, I've already said that we're looking for things that require a very modest input from our side, but which have a large potential impact. I'll be talking about foreign direct investment. The key to industrialization in the countries of interest to us lies in FDI. Without bringing in FDI, you're just not going to get this to happen. And so from the public policy point of view, there are two key agencies, the investment agency and the local content unit. The investment agency pulls in general manufacturing FDI. Uh, the local content unit tries to piggyback the multinationals who will inevitably come anyway for extractive uh, resources, the oil and gas companies, and tries to get local companies integrated into their supply chains, thus multiplying the number of jobs created by the uh, FDI that's coming in. One thing that we discover once we get into the whole FDI area and investment agencies in particular is that there are three key barriers that keep coming up. If you ask what's holding things back, land, power, and logistics. And logistics is transport and customs. So today, the two projects that we'll be talking about are centered in areas where we think there's a lot of leverage. In other words, getting this particular bottleneck in the system fixed has a big impact. So I'm going to be talking about investment agencies. I'll also mention uh, local content units. I'm going to talk mostly about the Ethiopian Investment Commission, where I started uh, introducing a relationship building program and over the past two years we've done this job and it's now completed and we're now winding down and closing off the project so I'm in a position to describe to you the whole story of this. I'm glad to see that Atta Nawai is with us because when I wrote my Enterprise Map of Ethiopia book some years ago I wrote a letter to Atta Nawai saying look there's four jobs that I could do and he said, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, do the investment agency. And that was very good advice, and I followed it uh, much to my advantage. Because this was going well, I was asked um, 18 months ago to do the same thing in Tanzania, and we're now midway through the same process with the Tanzania Investment Center. My real agenda in Tanzania, however, is local content, and again, a job has cropped up, and my big item in Tanzania at the moment is that we now have a local content unit in place and we're beginning to make the first plans to get it operational. What Rob will talk about is a new customs channel in Myanmar, uh, an ideal example of what I'm talking about in terms of these specific jobs, because reforming a customs ministry is an enormous task. In Ethiopia, it's 
got an army of IFC people doing a wonderful job over a five-year period to turn around the customs system. In Myanmar, it'll take time to achieve that. The key thing is to pull out a module that is independent and which does most of the work. And for reasons Rocco will explain, a very small part of the customs operation actually carries most of the key exporting companies. And fixing that particular module becomes a job of the kind I'm describing. Now I'm going to talk about one example at length, the uh, Ethiopian Investment Commission. With investment agencies, there is a pretty dismal picture around the world in that, for example, some dozen years ago, the World Bank telephoned every investment agency in Africa. And they found that 70% 70, 70 of telephone calls went unanswered. The one thing an investment agency has to be is to be at the end of the telephone. The ambitions of investment agencies tend to be overly modest. The standard thing that consultancy groups do when they come in to fix an investment agency is to tell them this is all about having a one-stop shop operation. Frankly, that's baby steps. The ambition that you need is to be a world-class agency. There's a standard international model pioneered by Finland, Ireland, and Singapore, which is called relationship building. The whole idea is to change the culture of the agency away from giving permissions and issuing licenses towards the act of helping of firms to get them to circumvent unnecessary and inappropriate obstacles which stop them creating jobs. So it involves an interaction on a regular basis with companies to get away from putting out fires to having a system for helping companies get around standard difficulties in standard ways. I first walked into the investment agency in Ethiopia five years ago, and at that time, it was full of hardworking, dedicated professionals, and they were putting out fires, quite frankly. Uh, one emergency here, one emergency there, a firm in trouble here. The key is to bring that under control. It sounds simple. But the challenge is actually one of organizational change. It goes very deeply into the notion of what is this agency about? What are we here to do? It's changing attitudes and it's changing culture. And what's been very gratifying is to find that now I walk into the investment agency, it's calm, it's orderly. The monthly meetings go through their agenda so smoothly and beautifully. A real service is given to companies in a calm, systematic, and effective way. And that represents a sea change in the way an agency works. It's changing attitudes. So the question is, how can you help the director to bring around a change like that? Well, there's one prerequisite and one ingredient. The, the only advice I would offer anybody who sets out to do a job of this kind is first ask one question. Is the person in charge of the agency, the person you're trying to help, are they excellent? If the answer is no, don't do the job. Because there's no chance you'll succeed. If the director is excellent, and by that I mean that the director has all the necessary competences. And I, I have been extremely fortunate that prior to doing this job, the government put in place Mr. Fitzmaurega, who is one of the hardest working and most effective people I've ever met. Uh, and it's a joy to work with him. Now, that requires not only internal management and endless working with companies, it also requires very good contacts in government and the ability to get things done with ministers and get results. So you need to have that leadership there. Once that leadership is there, the job becomes possible, routine, very doable. Without that, forget it. So the first thing is, if that's not in place, then tell the relevant people you need to find somebody to lead this agency who can really do the job. So all we're doing is helping. Once that key prerequisite in place is in place, the key ingredient is very simple. The embedding of new practices and procedures. 
It sounds so simple, but it takes time and it takes patience. Because what you're saying is, look, here's a routine, here's a procedure, this is the way you do it. But then you've got to track it month after month, making sure it happens, making sure the new routines are followed. Because the routines carry people forward and allow the change to occur in the culture of the agency. When you know that it's a success is when these practices and procedures are taken over and changed by the in-house people in the agency. Our turning point was when the director revamped the schedule of the monthly meetings and said, we're not going to go through every firm, we're going to identify live issues on the table, and that's the way we'll arrange our agenda. And I thought, yes, because now the team internally are reshaping and remolding things to make them better and more effective. So this is permanent. Because now, it's not my system anymore, no way. This is the in-house system, this is the way it operates. They modify it, they change it. The team have taken it over. So that's what you're aiming for. You're aiming to make yourself redundant. That's the point. I realize there isn't anything clever or surprising here. I mean, anyone who knows about organization is going to say, so, okay, so what's the new here? Um, what I want to focus on is a few key points. I've already said the trick is to identify a job that's worth doing, something that's going to give leverage, because you know we have limited time and resources. You need something that's worth doing. It does require patience, because uh, I'm not going to bore you with all the setbacks and glitches, but believe me, every job has setbacks and glitches, and you have to write it out. But the other observation I would make is that if you're trying to go into a, a public sector agency, and you're trying to say, okay, you guys have ways of doing things, but actually there's this other way of doing things, and we'd like you to do things in this other way, you're asking people to change their habits. That's one of the hardest things to do. Um, changing my habits, just ask my wife. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't happen. Um, changing habits is the key. In order to do that, you need to keep the message very simple. And you need to insist on one thing. And with this particular job, the message was very simple. You're going to put a lot of procedures and practices into place. You're going to have this new software. You're going to do all this stuff. This will be the way the reports are filed by the group leaders every week. But, 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 uh, nothing matters except the monthly meeting. Because every month there will be a meeting of the industry group leaders and the director. There will be about 12 people around the table. We put in a progress chaser to make sure that all the papers are prepared for this. But this is sacrosanct. It's never missed. The agenda is always followed. You go through every firm or every issue. Anything that has been tabled is never lost sight of. There are agreed action points on each issue by the end of that meeting. These are minuted. They're tabled. They will come up at the next meeting. At the next meeting, the director will say, okay, was that action taken? What was the result of that? What's the next action? Sometimes I have a sense of unreality in, uh, in the fact that I'm doing this in Ethiopia because uh, nobody in Ethiopia needs to be told this. This was precisely what the then prime minister of Ethiopia did in organizing the first great industrial uh, policy success in Ethiopia, which was the booming cut flowers sector. When some cut flowers producers came over the border and started operating in Ethiopia, they realized there was a window of opportunity with these Dutch flower producers, and they started to help firms build up business. And the prime minister convened monthly meetings with action points, and he would look around the table, and he would say, okay, what was the action point agreed? And he'd say to the minister, well, was that done? And the minister would say, oh, yes, prime minister. And then he'd turn to the business people and say, was it done? And they'd say, well, actually, no. And he'd turn to the minister and said, next month it will be done. 
So uh, sometimes I, I have this sense of unreality and that I, I need, uh, I'm saying this in Ethiopia. The Ethiopians know this. So there's no big trick. There's no secret. This, this, is, this is nothing we're inventing. This is a standard formula for getting business done. And this is a standard method that you build up relationship building systems in investment agencies. The point is to do it. The challenge is the implementation, making it happen. And all you can do is stand behind a good director in agency and just make it happen. The details. This involved a lot of stuff. And I don't want to start getting into the details of we did this on Monday, we did this on Tuesday. Uh, broadly speaking, we put in a lot of new software to support weekly reporting and monthly meetings. We had a huge program of lifting all the paper files from the archive. The professional staff used to, go, used to hate one thing, going down the archive and begging the archivist to find the file on some company where the guy was standing up on the third floor wanting the business done now. We needed to eliminate that by lifting everything out of the basement where a lot of stuff was lost, getting it scanned, putting it onto a system so everyone had a secure file sharing system to which they had access where everything was at their fingertips. We had a build-up program gradually building up from 50 firms to the now 425 firms we cover. Deciding what firms to cover is central. My first lesson in the plan was that I did a statistical survey of every firm covered by the agency in the old days and found that only 10% of the firms to whom all this attention was being devoted in this rather random way were serious employment creators that would ever employ more than 50 people. So you can immediately get rid of 90% of the firms and focus on the 10% that were actually creating jobs. Uh, so building up the set of firms, identifying firms, finding criteria, letting people develop within the agency their own criteria for bringing firms into the system. We had to develop an agenda and arrangements for the monthly meeting that we could put in place because what you do is you put something quick and dirty in place, something that will work, and then let the agency itself take it over and modify it and develop it because you want them to own it. So don't worry if it's quick and dirty because the whole point is it's going to get fixed and improved. Turning points. The most gratifying thing that happened early on was that I started meeting people in the corridor and they were coming towards me smiling and say, hey, this is working. Because the professional staff used to go out and visit companies. It was always part of their job. But they somehow saw it as a minor part of their job. It was the fun part. And now they're suddenly realizing, actually, that's our job. That's the whole job. And that's what the director wants to know about us. And that's how we get brownie points at the monthly meetings. And actually, this job is a lot more interesting. Because then firms started to express approval. We got comments coming back from firms like, I shouldn't say this, but I will. Uh, this is the only agency that really works for us. Uh, so. Uh, the professional staff start to feel good about it. Now, if you're bringing people on board and you're trying to change practices and procedures, people have to get something out of it. You know, sometimes you can incentivize people with money. It was very important in Tanzania, for example, when we were lifting all the stuff out of the archives and getting them online to get people to work overtime in the evenings to get it done. And people really appreciated the fact they were formally paid extra overtime rates for doing this. So, I'm not against financial incentives, but the real incentive here was job satisfaction. That one of the assets you've got if you're working with a public agency is at the end of the day, this is a potentially very rewarding job because people feel good that they are providing a valuable public service. Many people feel that they're lost in a bureaucracy and what they're doing is actually not very rewarding. But if you're dealing with companies, the morale boost here is great. In Ireland, you know, 40 years ago when they did this, the people, at the, the people loved to work for the Irish Development Agency because they were perceived throughout the country as the really useful agency because they were the ones that created jobs in a country that had been plagued by unemployment for 30 years. This is a potentially very rewarding job and that's what you need to leverage. I've already talked about what constitutes success and the real turning point is 
when the people, the professionals in the organization just take over the system and run it in their own way. So my central point is that practices and procedures can be a lever. It's a very easy thing to introduce. It just takes patience. There's a recipe. You need to track it month after month until it happens, until people get used to it. But it's a skeleton on which you can change people's approach to change people's way of seeing what the objective of the job is. And using the practice and procedures and the skeleton of the monthly meeting to do this is the real focus. I've already talked about investment agencies. At the moment, I'm embarking, I, I'm just about to embark on a similar job with the local content unit in Tanzania. That is, again, an area where there's a trusted and tried international formula for getting multinationals to use local companies in their supply chain. The big multinational oil and gas companies are very well disposed to doing this once it's done in the right way. But governments around the world miss the great opportunity because they fall for the big fallacy. And the big fallacy is there's a policy, there's a lever, all I have to do is pull it. I'll put into law that you have to have 70% local content. And zero happens. Ghana lost two years doing that. Now they're back on track. The point is this requires active negotiation with multinationals to reach an understanding about how to bring companies through training programs that will make them accredited vendors that can apply through tenders for opportunities to supply. This is something that's well understood, but putting it in place requires patience and effort. And for a government to think you can legislate for this is a mistake. This is something which is done by procedure. And uh, that's the, the next uh, job of this kind that I'm focused on now. Rocco will speak for himself. Rocco is quite capable of uh, speaking for himself, so I'm not going to steal his thunder. I just want to point out the great commonality. Uh, it was when Rocco came to talk to me about something recently that I realized that he and I had so much in common that we were doing the same thing in the same way and if you get two instances of something, we thought, well, actually, there might be some other guys in the network that come across things like this. And it might be interesting to have an informal chat among ourselves about the ups and downs of doing this kind of job. So, Rocco. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.